everyone, and welcome back for our last session here. Thank you for joining us for the panel. We have a wonderful and diverse group of panelists today who are going to share with us a bit about how they've been using H5P at UBC. So Simon and I are going to start out by asking a few questions to the panelists, and then we'll also open up the floor at the end for everyone to ask questions. But you're also welcome to feel free to interject with questions throughout in the chat or by raising your hand if you have a follow up to one of the questions we've asked for some of our panelists. So first I'm gonna introduce our panelists and then we'll learn a bit about how they've been using H5P. So our first panelist is Dr. Strang Burton, who is an assistant professor of teaching in linguistics at UBC. And his research focuses on the documentation and revitalization work for severely endangered languages. He has been using H5P in his first year linguistics course and also to develop an online course in pronunciation with linguistic and sorry linguists and community members at the Stolo Nation. Our next panelist is Dr. Roger Becky, who is a professor in the Department of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences with a broad research focus on groundwater hydrology and geochemistry. He has adopted H5P in his graduate level course to provide opportunities for active learning for his students and this course is going to be part of an online graduate certification program. Next, we have Dr. Luisa Canuto, who is an associate professor of teaching in the Department of French, Hispanic, and Italian Studies at UBC, and the language director of the Italian program. She founded and coordinated the Italian program for UBC Continuing Studies and was instrumental in developing educational programs for faculty members in what is now CTLT. She is currently the PI of the large TLDF Changing Courses, Learning Romance Languages and Hybrid Courses. She has been using H5P to create interactive videos to help support learning in her lower level Italian hybrid courses. And finally, we have a professor student team of Dr. Fong Chen and Irene Luang. Dr. Chen is an assistant professor of teaching in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at UBC. Her educational and research interests include incorporating innovative technology to complement traditional approaches to teaching. And Irene is a student in the Faculty of Pharmace Pharmaceutical Sciences. Fong has been working with students in her pharmacy classes, such as Irene, to use H5P in very innovative ways. They have used H5P interactive videos to convert a traditional case study from their course into an escape room. So, Thank you everyone on the panel for joining us today. And I'm sure everyone would be very excited to hear a bit more about your work in H5P and perhaps see an example of what your projects look like. So Strang, I'm gonna ask if you can start us off. Can you share a little bit more about your project with H5P in linguistics and in the Stolo Nation? And you're welcome to share, you're all welcome to share your screen at any time if it would be helpful to um, show your H5P content in context. Um, sure, thank you, Kylie. So I teach a large intro linguistics course and I've really enjoyed using H5P as supplementary materials for that. We did a series of short interactive modules where you just see some information and then you'd answer a series of questions. Um, one of these was about the languages of Canada, another one about the languages of Africa. And I'm working on a series about writing systems um, because we teach about writing systems. And uh, I'll show you one in a second um, that we've been working on for Hangul. Um, I'm also, um, as Kylie mentioned, I work with uh, a community program at the Stalo Nation and we're developing a large course um, in pronunciation of the language using uh, some ultrasound images and linguistic explanations of the sounds. Uh, for it's going to be an open course. It's it's a Canvas course, like an open Canvas course, uh, but it has a bunch of H5P modules embedded in that. What I'll show you though now is my Hangul piece. There we go. So this is on uh, my UBC uh, blog, Dexterous Tongue, and here you see the piece uh, Hangul is Honey Jam. Uh, I wrote this uh, with a Korean grad student in linguistics, Stanley Nam. So it's an introduction to the uh, Korean writing system, Hangul, which is, those of you who are familiar with it, you know, it's a really fascinating writing system. I don't know Korean, but Stanley um, uh, led me through this. Um, so there's a picture of King Sejong. And a couple of ways that I wanted to use um, uh, the H5P modules. So this is H5P modules embedded into the WordPress blog. A couple of uh, ways I wanted to use it. One, 
I wanted to use the principle of pre-training uh, so that you can get some of the students are trained on some of the sort of basic parts of the presentation before you get into the more complex parts. So I did a pre-training module before we even get into Hangul. I'm having them learn a series of words in Korean just phonetically. Okay. So they learn the word for dog. They learn the word for gap. Okay. They learn the word for um, this is not a word by itself, but for uh, uh, for uh, this occurs in the word for um, Korea. Han. Um, and then this is South Korea. Nam Han. And then the word for Hangul. Hangul. And then the word for cool jam, which means literally honey jam, but it means awesome. And then you have an interactive test here uh, where this the student goes through and they have to see if they can, uh, remember the vocabulary and they can keep doing it until until they've got it um, got it right. So you so this is the pre-training part, and then you get a little summary there. And then when I do the text, I go into the text, and then I have a little bit of text explaining how it works. And then I embed another H5P piece for each word, which summarizes the symbol. So this is the symbol for the sound K. This is a symbol for the vowel E. And then it explains the, the sequencing is a little bit different from English. So sometimes it's beside, sometimes it's underneath. Um, and this one goes beside, so it explains that. And then I have the students, right? It's not refreshing. Then I have the student, um, this, this would be an interactive piece. I'm sorry, it's not showing because I already did it. Um, but then they have to create the, they have to put the characters together themselves. And then you see that this is the, okay. this is the Hangul for, for um, dog. And then it goes on from there. Uh, you build increasingly complicated um, ones. So you, then you do kep. And again, each one, I want the students interactively to do it. So you see the characters, you see how they combine. And then you have to figure out which one it is yourself. I don't even tell them. And then they see it there. And they go through and they build the Hangul for South Korea. Then they build the Hangul for Hangul. Um, then they build the Hangul for Awesome or literally Honey Jam. And then at the end, after they've done all that, they can read the title of the post, which I can't pronounce, right? But it, this is, they can read this now that Hangul is Honey Jam, Hangul is Awesome. And then I'm getting a little bit more into um the, the design features there. So that's uh, that's an example of the H5P piece that we've been using uh, in uh, uh, Ling 101. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much for sharing those great examples of H5P. Um, Roger, are you able to share with us a little bit more about the H5P project you have in your graduate level um, EOAS course? Yeah, certainly. Um, the uh, And so I first I want to acknowledge that um, uh, Manuel Gias has been my partner in this, and I, I provided the content, and he's really, uh, in terms of instructional design and implementation of, of H5P, he's been the real master, so I want to acknowledge his great leadership there. The, um, yeah, the problem I'm trying to solve, so we, we've we developed a, um, a graduate certificate program, which consists of three graduate level courses for geological engineers, and it's fully online. Uh, the idea being that the um, a lot of our students are going to be working somewhere um, not at, at UBC, and the opportunity cost to come here on campus and take a course is just too high. So we wanted to lower that opportunity cost and deliver the course online and, and as much as possible asynchronously so that they could work evenings and weekends, et cetera. So the, the, the challenge was, how do you make a course active? And the... Uh, and how do you promote active learning in an online context? Uh, talking to uh, Roland Stahl, who's in our department, who's you may know is a real online guru. He said, videos of lectures and similar are death for students. And so um, he uh, promoted, and I think he's right, is uh, a, a strategy where we have short sort of text and, and online content in Canvas and then um, opportunities for the students to test themselves frequently. And so uh, the, the H5P, we've, I've conceptually, I, I'm using it 
to try to bring active learning into uh, into the course so that there's low stakes opportunities for students to try out concepts and see if they've got them right and more more for sort of uh, knowledge development and then in terms of knowledge assessment and course assessment then we revert more to either canvas quizzes or in our case it's it's project related so the course that that i put online is a course i've been teaching for over 25 years <laughs> um face to face which it relates to groundwater modeling of groundwater flow it's, it's sort of um it can be mathematical, but uh, you can imagine uh, it's a technical course. And so let me see if I can share um, this, just an example. So this is one of the introductory modules. And just like some of our students, uh, even though they're all um, practicing engineers, will not have dealt with groundwater much. And so just like here's an introduction to the to the um, groundwater cycle, for instance. And the uh, my approach to teaching face-to-face -face is Socratic. So my approach is never tell them anything. I always ask them and get them to try to tell you. And um, and the idea is that that will start thinking, okay, what's the answer to that? You know, so that it's that active learning approach. And so uh, the question was, how do you, how can we map this over into an online uh, context? And the, the idea here was that uh, pose a bunch of questions and give answers. And so, so here, um, here's one, um, H5P module, just an introduction. So groundwater is so groundwater is any liquid residing in the subsurface, including water found in oil reservoirs, near surface soils, and in very small pores of igneous rocks. And so say you you guessed false. Um, what we want to do is give instant feedback, low stakes. And so here there's feedback, you know, like this is not right. You know, this is groundwater is any liquid, that da da da. And so, uh, so you can you can um, do that. You can you can find out what the right solution is. And so this this is not great. And so here's another one: um, the total volume of brown water on Earth is da da da. And you know, so say you selected five times larger than surface water. Uh, and this this goes on to explain. But no, it's not right. It's uh, it's it's um, it's about the same size as the ice. Anyways, groundwater is a big reservoir. So so. Students can march through these H5P examples. Um, uh, they, uh, instead of telling them something, we pose it as a question and then they get instant feedback. And then um, hopefully they, they learn from that rapid feedback cycle. And then again, this is mostly for the instructional or the learning part. And then for the, and for the assessment part, we have assignments and, um, and actually in this case, a, a, a large project. We also use discussion groups, et cetera, but we're still trying to learn what's the best uh, format for uh, uh, online distance education at, at the graduate level. But we found this uh, this approach here with H5P really, really valuable. And I, and I think it's fair to say that I'm only scratching the surface in terms of the, the capabilities. One of the things that um, uh, Manuel did really well, which is, um, there's a lot of mathematics and equations in some of this and uh, to figure out how to format that correctly. So, so it looks good and, and it's easy to understand was a challenge too. So, so I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think I, I like how you've been able to use H5P to take what you would do in the classroom with that Socratic method approach and be able to move it on to an online class. That's a really smart use of it. Um, Luisa, are you able to share how you've been using H5P for language learning in your Italian classes? Sure, sure. So I should give a little context. So first of all, I also want to thank very much to someone who has been instrumental in developing what I what I've been using, and it's Bosung uh, Kim from CTLT. Um, she's helped so much, also really just thinking the design behind not just uh, not just the technical aspect, but really also the design, the slides that I'm using, the videos, the color, the accessibility. So. Thank you. Um, so a little context on the project. So I apply for this larger TLEF, which involves the three language programs in my department, Italian um, and I am the language program director for the Italian program, but also we have Spanish and French involved. 
And we are planning to develop 12 courses uh, in first and second year within the next uh, within the next 18 months. So and interestingly, we have been we are using H5P in very different ways. So I can I can I can talk to you about the way I'm using it and I prepare a few um, screenshots uh, and I can show you. So. Um, a couple of things that I had to face, first of all, specific to the project. Uh, this this year, as I was developing the Italian 101, so I started with the 101, and I only started to teach the course in January. So we are still testing a lot of the, uh, we are evaluating, there's an extensive uh, evaluation plan behind this project. So I will be better able to say exactly how things are working a little bit later on. But for now, the impact has been very positive. So I decided to use it in two different ways, H5P, interactive videos in both cases. But um, first of all, uh, for me was use H5P to introduce each major unit. Um, so I develop slides, I created videos, and then I use H5P interactive videos to really introduce the different concepts, the different um, grammatical concepts primarily of each unit, and then use another video to review everything. Um, a challenge that is not just um, you know common to language learning, but in general, is that even if it's an Italian one or one, we have students coming with different levels of prior knowledge. So we have students who obviously they may already speak another Romance language, so it's very obvious to to them what a grammatical concept like genders, for example, uh, singular and plural, the differences and all of that. Th those are um, you know easy concept uh, for Romance language um, speakers to grasp, but, but for those learners who are, you know, completely new to Romance languages, that can be a challenge. So it's a way to give everybody the possibility to work on their own on introducing this fundamental concept and give them the chance to really revisit that. So for the ones who are, you know, don't need much learning on those concepts, don't need much practice, they can go through the videos very quickly, but the other students, obviously, they can take multiple attempts. Let me show you a couple of slides. Um, you can see now there's a lot of text, so don't look at the text. Obviously, some of it is in Italian, some of it in English, but this is just to say that I'm using as an assignment, I, you see here is, I introduced the, the learning goals of the unit, and then there's the video. And uh, uh, there's a video, and I say this is unit zero, part one of the video. Really mindful uh, also, thanks to what Boso uh, uh, taught me to keep the videos really quite short. And, uh, um, and then at the end of the video, the interactive videos, the students answer the questions. So, and I ask them to also post a screenshot. So I want to see that they are doing that they are actually do engaging with the with the uh, with the content, right? And it's really easy for me because I use complete and complete. So it takes me. I have thirty five students, no, thirty four at the moment. So it's really quite fast for me to go through this. And again, same thing, I use, this is an example of unit one revision. Again, I say, okay, this is what we, what we did. Is everything clear? And again, they go through the videos once, in, in, in different videos. I'm using some of the slides that I use for the uh, introductory video, but not necessarily. And then again, they have the opportunity to review everything. So that's number one. I'm using it primarily for asynchronous classes. So this is a hybrid course. I should have mentioned that actually. And we don't, we are still testing what hybrid means in our cases. So for example, a calling in French is doing 50% hybrid. In my case, is 25% of the time is hybrid. So we're still kind of testing how much hybrid, how much asynchronous. Uh, so um, again, but this is our, I am using these videos for this hybrid session. Oops. The second way that I'm, I'm, I'm using uh, is with discussions. 
And, and again, this is the student, again, 101, which means very little knowledge of the language. Uh, so, um, and this is something fun. So in the first case, you saw that I created the videos, I created the slides, and then I created these interactive videos in H5P. This second case, I took a video from YouTube. Uh, this is a short animated movie, and I added some questions. So it's a fun movie that uh, animated movie that is giving me the opportunity to talk about diversity. Uh, language learning means to me, it's a very important concept that I want my students to, to learn and appreciate is that learning a language gives us all the responsibility to appreciate a different culture, to embrace a different culture, to understand diversity. And this is a, was an excuse for me using a fun lead animated video. And I attach some, again, some uh, um, some H5P questions, and here you can see. But again, it really was mostly to really engage the students using the first case is an assignment. This case, it's a discussion, really creating community, being able to bring also some important topic um, um, topics uh, and use a, a different tool in Canvas, obviously. Yeah. So this is it for now. Thank you That's so much funny. for sharing with us. Yeah. Now, our... Our next two panelists have worked together. So I'm going to ask Fong and Irene if you can together maybe tell us about the project that you've worked on and show us um, an example of what the H5P content came out as. Sure, thank you. Um, so I will actually just talk a little bit about our partnership and then where this comes from. And then um, I'll have Irene uh, share on screen the project that we worked on. So um, we had worked on together because we have a fund from UBC called the Student as Partners uh, Grant. And this is a grant to have a partnership with students within the course to help redesign um, and change some parts of the course to make it more interactive and more engaging for for their fellow students. So as a part of this team, I actually have Irene with me today and we're disseminating this together. But the rest of our team, I, I also have to shout out to them as well. So we also have Mina, um, Elisa and Patty. Um, they are also a part of our team. And of course we had lots of support from CTLT from John Chang as well. Um, so what our uh, SAP was designed to do was redesign the course under um, the ETP PharmD program. So that's the Entry to Practice Doctorate of Pharmacy program. And I teach a nephrology module within a larger course. So this larger course is 15 credits and my module falls within that course. And we basically have um, worked on two different activities that incorporated H5P. And the main thing that we've used with H5P is the media component, which is the interactive videos, as well as some quiz components as well. So the first thing that I want to um, share is um, we had decided to start an escape room activity. So we took a traditional case that was um, used in the traditional sense where it was sort of um, a paper-based type of case that was converted to a file that was online. But then we thought to make it more creative, we made it into an escape room. And then one of the things that we wanted to do was introduce the escape room idea by using H5P. So this is sort of the interactive video introducing the escape room case to students. So Irene, did you want to just take over here? Yeah, so I can share what the escape room introduction looked like. So once students go into log into Canvas, they're um, brought to this page and then they'll click start course. And then here we are introducing the scenario to the students using H5P. And then we also have incorporated the video where we have the first hint for the students. If I can play. Hello, I will meet you in my office in 45 minutes to go over the patients you have been assigned to take care of. Before then, I want you to work up a new patient that has recently been referred to our clinic. OS is a 73-year-old cisgender white male whose GP has identified as someone with abnormal kidney function given his age, comorbidities, and lab results. He will be coming to the clinic later today for assessment and education. Make sure to double check his medication allergies. See you then. And that is our first activity using 5HP. And then the yeah. second one I can show you here. Yeah, so this second one, just as um, Irene is getting it ready, is that we're using also the H5P as an interactive video where this is, so the first one for the escape room was 
uh, an in-person sort of hybrid where we use H5P with a facilitator in a classroom setting. This is actually being using H5P where it's asynchronous. So students actually would do this as a video that they watch at home as asynchronous sort of homework um, or review so that they can understand the concepts of uh, acute kidney injury. So then I'll let Irene share what this looks like. So this is a case that we have created where we have introduced the, the patient as well as we have interactive components logged in. I'll quickly show a bit of the introduction and then I can show you the interactive sections as well. The man had a deep lung CI and this is what happened to his kidneys. CL is a 75. This is at two times speed. Uh, is that okay? I might slow it down. Year old male of Asian descent presenting to the clinic with complaints of feeling genuinely unwell for the past three days with symptoms of fatigue, nausea, and decreased urine output and increased urine frequency. CL has been devoted to a new healthy lifestyle. In his younger years, CL was an avid smoker. So that case continues and it talks about where this patient is presenting and their history. And then afterwards, after the students are given the case, we want patient, students to actively use what they have learned and apply it to this patient case scenario. And we want this to be very low stakes, so it's it can be used multiple times. It's not worth any marks, and it's more of an optional activity. And questions. Feel free to rewind to see patient information. We'll review all the answers together. What DTPs have you found with this case? So here we use 5HP to um, have students answer at these questions. I mean, they can check it, so, so, so show their solution, and then they can, and then it goes on. And we used, try to use different types of questions so that students are able to learn in different ways. And then after we show the answers, or once the students have answered these questions, in the video as well, we explain each option and why the answers are what they are, and then it brings more a clear understanding of how to apply knowledge that they learned from class to a more scenario-based. And I think that's it. Fong, was there anything else that we should show? No, I think that was a good piece of both. Um, I think that you can just see here that it can be used both in an in-person setting um, as well as uh, asynchronously as homework for the students. Thank you so much for sharing. And you've got you've uh, as a panel have shared a number of different content types that you might be able to use in H5P. I'm wondering about what your preferred or favorite content types are. Roger, you showed us uh, what looked like a question set with some true and false and multiple choice in there. Is that what you do most of your questions on, or do you use a variety? What do you gravitate towards? Um, yeah, I use a, we use a variety. We've tried um, some numerical answers as well. So it's, it's a lot of a lot of the stuff later is is quantitative and you know how much flow is going this way or, or things like that. Um, so, but yeah, but mostly sort of short questions. We haven't or I haven't uh, explored videos yet, but mm -hmm. it's it's more just my lack of imagination and. <laughs> time versus uh um so so that's why I'm I'm actually looking forward to understanding how other people have applied it. Um and I know for instance when we were putting the course together, I would be sending a slide deck with materials to Manuel and we'd have it online for the students the next week. So it was very just in time delivery, a mea culpa on that too. So but yeah, so mostly mostly questions, I guess you would say. And um, so you mentioned, sorry, um, oh, one sec, so you... Just numerical, just, we have some numerical the numerical, questions. that's what I wanted to ask you about. Numerical, yeah. how did, because H5P can't naturally understand a number as far as I know, how did you construct those questions to have the students give a numerical answer that was consistently marking them a correct or incorrect? Were yeah. you able to, were you or Manuel able to find a workaround to that? And I'll ask manual maybe to to chime in here on that because I, I i don't think it's i don't think we've solved it entirely but uh... yeah that's definitely a problem I, i'd love to know the answer it's a problem i've had so oh you're uh there you go manual. I, i'm not a panelist i'm not supposed to answer you know, <laughs> we're inviting um, you in uh yeah we have to be uh Creative. I don't think we have a perfect solution to this um i think what we've been doing using the uh, essay question uh, because we can look for keywords 
Um, so that's one way, but there was no way at this moment to provide uh, opportunity for students to write uh, numerical answers. So I was hoping you would not ask that question. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking through some of the questions, and um, uh, one way we've done it is through clever multiple choices, I guess, um, with appropriate detractors. But uh, uh, it's, I think it's better for the students if if we don't give them options and they they have to work it out themselves and uh, make those mistakes because you know that that pain learning feedback I think is really helpful. So um, and it's a bit easier if you have multiple choices, but. Uh, that's that's something that would be great uh, if we could if we could do that in uh, H5P. Yeah, absolutely. I've I've used myself having um, the answers being numeric, but always having to, as for example, a fill in the bank question, but always having to be very clear about the exact format that they should give the answer in to make sure that it it can um, understand the question. Simon, I see that you have your hand raised. Yeah, there's a, um, uh, a question from the chat for Fong and Irene. Uh, is your usage for formative assessment only? Oh, uh, so the usage of it is only for formative assessment. For summative assessment in our program, we actually use Canvas um, through the quiz quizzes or assignments. We don't uh, use the H5P. Thank you very much. And now I'm wondering, um, Strang, what sort of content types do you find the most helpful? I think where we, what were you showing us? Was that the presentation yeah, content so type? And then is there anything also, are there any content types that you avoid? Um, so I, I think everything I've done has been the, the presentation wrapper. And then inside that, the interactivity, I use a lot of multiple choice. I like the one where you you have the words and you drag them into the spaces, fill in the blanks like that. Mm -hmm. um, that one works good. And we've done some, what I was seeing with um, Irene and Fong's uh, piece where you have the video and then it stops and asks, asks questions. I think those are the ones that, uh, those are the main ones that we've used. Okay, thanks. And now, I mean, for this is a question for anyone on the panel, for all of you, which is there are lots of different tools that we could imagine using. What is it that you have found that H5P can do that other tools cannot? And when might you choose to use a tool other than H5P? I can answer. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I used to do a lot of interactive pieces for my language work using the tools we had before H5P. So they used to be back in the 90s, there was different tools for that. Um, and today, I think it would all be done. If you weren't using H5P, I think it would all be done in JavaScript. Um, and um, you could do more custom stuff with JavaScript, but it's hard, you know, for for a non-specialist like me to create that or to get a specialist to do it for me is pretty complicated. So to me, the advantage of H5P is that it's stable and it works really well and it's very, very easy to do to get that interactivity. There's other ways to get it, but you could never get it, I think, that simply. Does anyone, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thanks. It, anyone else have uh, a different experience of why they chose H5P or what they like about it? Uh, for me, one of the big design questions was um, the, where to embed the course. We knew Canvas would be involved, but would uh, a lot of the learning materials be in, say, like a Pressbooks? And then and then you'd have this back and forth between Pressbooks and, and uh, Canvas. Mm -hmm. I think one of the advantages of H5P is that uh, my understanding is it can, it can appear in, in multiple formats, but it does appear well in Canvas. I still have some some challenges with Canvas because I, I think uh, content management, I always, I always liken it to trying to play the piano with boxing gloves and that, you know, you, you don't have that sort of detailed functionality that you'd like in um, in Canvas that you would say if you're word processing or something like that. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, for our purposes, for online, um, activities and the fact that we can go seamlessly between uh, H5P questions and then uh, Canvas questions where we can log everything and get statistics. I think that's been very, very useful. So um, so that, that's one reason why H5P, I think, was desirable for us. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead. And if, yeah, yeah. Uh, so very briefly, in my case, so we, we, we use Canvas extensively in our courses, meaning um, we use a lot of quizzes for preparation, uh, the quiz type. And um, 
the the problem with when we use quiz is even if it's just formative you know 25 percent of our courses is is really preparation so the students have to prepare they have to come prepared to classes and that's quite but whenever we use quizzes on canvas there is always the perception the students attach a lot of value to to those quizzes even if they're just 10 points or 20 mm. points and we have like 50 of those quizzes throughout the term so they attach so much value to those so using h5p and this video has really gave me the opportunity to to make sure that it was lower stakes so that it was more interactive more fun immediate so much more formative and uh, even if all the quizzes that we use for preparations are meant to be formative and not summative, but still, I think that it was really to acknowledge how quizzes on Canvas are perceived by many of the students. I would actually just comment that I really agree with what Louisa is saying, because that's sort of how our faculty has approached it as well, which eight, with H5P, we use that um, and students identify it with just as you know, formative feedback only, and they can repeat as many times as they can. They don't feel any pressure. Um, whereas Canvas, it's more official. And I guess I know we can pull stats and uh, analysis on that. So that's why we do use Canvas in a different way. And so that's one of the major identifications from our students' point of view. And so they actually really like that. Um, I also really like the fact that with H5P, it's so interactive. Like it allows all those things, whereas Canvas does not allow those abilities. And we still haven't explored it all. So, yes. So for, for anyone here thinking about using H5P, it can be a big time investment just to figure out if it's a tool that's going to work. And then once you decide that to figure out actually how to use it, and then once you figure out how to use it to actually make all the content. So I also wanted to ask some questions to you about what it's been like to learn how to use H5P and what the workload's been like and if you have any recommendations. So maybe I'll start out um, with Louisa. What have you found the learning curve to be like in terms of yeah. Yeah. learning how to use H5P and also where did you find support to help with that? Yeah, so as I said, for me, the support has come from Bosom Kim from CTLT. I, I had attended some sessions actually last year. I remember attending this this symposium. So um, I, I'm, I, I was not completely new. Strang also taught me a little bit. Um, uh, but again, it, it was to me, you know, stepping into this large project, a larger TLDF with so much to do and trying to make some choices early on. So I... I then decided to approach H5P and use it the way I described it. Um, and again, there was so much going on. So preparing the video, preparing the slides, making sure that they were as accessible as possible and, and learning what it means um, in, in different ways. So to be honest, without Bosung, I would have probably given up. Even if it's simple, I, it's very intuitive. But again, without somebody saying, okay, let's do it together and giving me a, a, a you know, a specific, I also have to say that I started, I, I also became acting head uh, unexpectedly. So it was so much going on that without somebody uh, next to me guiding and helping and giving me a schedule and giving me, you know, specific deadline and time. Um, once you get into it, it's 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 great. It is there's a lot of but there are a lot of movable pieces, right? So um, so just having somebody next to me was was great. And again, it's not difficult. Uh, it is intuitive, but uh, um, but but again, for me, it was really and maybe it's me. I do I do like working in teams very very much. So. But to me, that, that has been very, very valuable. Yeah. And so how were you able to go about connecting with Bosa? Where did you, how did you know who to reach out to? How did you make that uh, connection? Well, actually, because of the larger TLEF, I was, I, I, I was suggested to get in touch with, uh, with a couple of different groups. And one was CTLT and, and, and the other one was, uh, was RTSIT. RTSIT was also going through some changes. Uh, so for me, it was easier actually to stay connected with Boson, who provided, you know, um, uh, consistency. And uh, uh, so we were able to uh, look at our schedule and, and, and work through the summer actually on, uh, on, on these on, on these videos um, so uh, Jeff Miller from CTLT was the one suggesting contact Boson because she has the experience that I was that I was looking for 
And now, Roger, you've also mentioned having um, a contact in CTLT with Manuel helping you. How did you connect with Manuel? And how do we all get a Manuel who can help us put uh, content in for us? How did that uh, come about? Uh, well, first, cheek swab. Hopefully, we can clone Manuel. But the um, in terms of the, uh, we also had a, um, I guess it was a, a I can't remember the specific acronym, but it was a, a grant basically to develop online content. So we made a proposal for this uh, certificate program. And then we were connected with a bunch of different people um, uh, who, could, who were going to support us in this online effort. And one was uh, CTLT and, and Manuel. So he kind of fell from the skies. And I <laughs> thank my lucky stars, you know, much like uh, Louisa, um, it's, uh, it's I'm sure that with with time and effort, I could I could uh, learn H5P, but uh, it's, I just it was just in time delivery, like I said, and, and having that skill. So I'm much more of a monkey see monkey do kind of guy. And um, if I have a, a bank of examples and everything, then I can kind of bootstrap my way up. And um, I think I feel that's the progress that that's the, the path that I took on Canvas. And I imagine a similar kind of thing would happen with H5P. So as soon as there's enough critical mass, the sufficient number of examples, I think I, I could uh, learn how to do it. But right now, I'm more just like, how do I do this, Manuel? <laughs> so we, we need more, We need I think we need more, uh, a, a larger experience uh, user base, and then that will happen naturally. Mm -hmm. So so you've mentioned having the, the, the grant that kind of helped um, have some of the resources available to do this. And Louisa, you mentioned having a large TLEF um, Fong, you mentioned also the students as partners grant. Is that right? String, have you had, have you all, uh, does anyone have anything else that they might recommend as something that someone could apply for to help to build some of these resources? String, have you had any support to build resources or have you been out here on your own? Um, as, as my support for the, uh, for the Stola piece is coming from the First Peoples Cultural Foundation, which funds language, language programs. For a First Nations language program, I think they would support another project like that for sure. The next, the next thing I'd like to ask about is, um, Fong, you had to learn how to use H5P and then you were also collaborating with students. So you had to help students figure out how to use it too. How did you do that piece of helping train students of how to use, how to author on H5P? Well, I'll, I'll get Irene to sort of answer that, but I'd have to say that I was pretty hands off with that. I actually, my students were really, they took to initiative and we, we actually, because of the, the SAP grant, we were able to get someone from CTLT to help us um, and also to train us in terms of knowing how to use different learning designs. And then John, as I mentioned at the beginning, John Cheng, he's actually from CTLT and he was actually the person that helped to onboard and train um, basically all of the students that were involved with creation of H5P. So maybe Irene can maybe talk about how he sort of helped trained us. Yes, of course. So before we even started on the project, we gave John the idea of what we pictured and what we wanted to see. And that's when he provided us with all the resources to take a look at. Um, that's when he suggested to use 5HP. Um, H5P and then we've been using it since so he just had uh, I think it was probably an hour or an hour and a half and he went through um, all the different ways to use it for the interactive video which was what I was focused on so he showed us showed me how to implement how to like he showed me an example and I think that was probably like same thing like monkey see monkey do so I just copied the same thing that he did multiple times and with a little bit of um, help from him in the beginning and then we just figured it out it was more intuitive than uh, it seemed at the beginning so I'm hearing that CTLT is very key to be able to um, have all these wonderful successful resources were there any other resources that you found outside of CTLT that you also would recommend that were helpful for anyone? I had a, I'll just start, uh, but I had a bit of trouble trying to load it onto Canvas, for example. Mm. So I just Googled and I know that there was a tutorial. So using that tutorial, finding that was also very useful, um, but that was probably the other resource that I used. Thank you. Yeah, I can add that um, ArtSIT was also very useful. So those of us uh, uh, who belong to, you know, the Faculty of Arts, that, that was very useful. There are a lot of 
you know, great folks working there who can provide, for example, again, I also had some issues with embedding the videos and this, and learning how to even, um, for example, I had to learn that, for example, it was best for me to create a YouTube channel and put the video, my videos in, 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 in a specific channel and then import the channels from there, then try different ways. So that took a little bit of learning. Um, we are still learning. For example, I just learned recently that I cannot use emoji in the titles of some of those, you know, so uh, so there are a lot of things that they were still learning. And, and again, RTS18, in this case, is really providing incredibly useful to me. And if I can also add something, Kyle, with, um, uh, with respect to, to what you were asking before, what was the excuse, you know, how come we started using H5P? I, I think in my case, but you know, this is what I heard from my colleagues. It's being attached to a very to to a specific project, right? Which is giving you the impetus, is giving you the the uh because uh, uh, we're we're all busy and we are already learning how to use. We had to learn to use uh, different technologies. So learning one more thing and uh, and and we are using Canvas and all that and all of that. So it's a. Uh, if to me it's really important that that is attached to a specific project, give me an excuse to really step outside of what I know uh, and learn something new. But so there are a lot of funding opportunities, even small, like again through CTLT, but not only. You know, students as partner, uh, OER project, uh, and TLEI project, uh, uh, creating a new certificate program. Anything that gives us, to me, as always, worth that is giving me the push to say, okay, try something. Now you have a good excuse to try something different. Mm -hmm. I, as a point, I just point out the H5P hub has been uh, was a really big step when that came online a couple of years ago. Before that, to use it, I had to set up my own site and set up uh, everything, and that was that was hard. H5P, the hub, has been really really useful. Yeah, absolutely. It's so wonderful that we have that resource available now. Well, Louisa, I'm, am I right in thinking that some you authored some questions with an undergraduate academic assistant? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So how, again, how did you, I'm, I'm curious, like, how did you, um, what did workflow look like in terms of having a student collaboration and making, yeah. like, helping yeah. get good quality content and yeah, what did that look yeah. like for you? So again, that's, that's, uh, um, my, my choice was also trying to, um, uh, give the student who's advanced learner of Italian language an opportunity to really practice the language too at, at, at a higher level. And so um, he, I, I asked him to learn how to use H5P through RTSIT. He was able to do that. And he was the one helping me develop some H5P activities in the YouTube short animated movies. But again, with, with some assistance. So, so obviously, as we know, you know, when you work with, with, with students, um, you have, it's not just that you're getting something, but you also need to, uh, to help them learn. So it's a, it's a, um, but I, I, I find it incredibly rewarding anyhow. So uh, um, the students that came up with that, with, with questions on, on the, on the show that he made in movies that I would not have, um, I, 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 I certainly would not have come up with. Uh, so it's been quite interesting, but he's done his own training and uh, I put him in touch with, uh, with artists IT and, and that was it for me. So, which is, which again was great. So I didn't need, I didn't need to educate him on HYP mm -hmm. I, at all. So he, he, he did it, you know. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, You've each mentioned different places that you that you use H5P in your courses. I, I think from your introduction, my right, Louisa, you said that you primarily do for right at the very beginning, because students are coming in with different levels and then also for discussion questions. String, you also mentioned right at the beginning doing the pre-training and then also part of the main content. Um, Roger, where do you find it helpful in your course to be putting these questions in? Is there a particular spot like as a pre-learning sort of activity or right in the middle or at the end to kind of check, where do you tend to pick to pick as a spot to put this content? Whenever whenever I'm introducing um, new concepts, I, I try to put, uh, you know, H5P content in. And so it's it's distributed through through the course, I guess it's, it's fair to say. 
Um, the, the one thing, just just listening to everyone talk, you know, the one one problem I'm still trying to solve effectively in, in sort of scalability. So we we have about 25 um, uh, students in the course this last term, um, and um, uh, we have uh, industry professionals come in and and what I've been, uh, what I've done to try to say you know, how does this theory apply in practice is we've had interviews with the industry uh, professionals. And I'm trying to think of a way to uh, make that interact and potentially using maybe H5P where I would ask, a we, we introduce it usually a site, you know, there's a, a problem at the Britannia mine, all this contaminated water is going into how sound. And so that's one of the case studies that we talk about. And then uh, maybe we'd say, okay, you know, here's an approach and then we could stop the video and then maybe post some questions. So anyways, um, how can I, uh, how can I, make interviews interesting and engaging and have people um, active and not have to redo it every year <laughs> for 25 <laughs> students each year because the, the industry professional is kind of like this is the same interview I did you know the last five years in a row so those those are some of the things that um, uh, I'd like to try uh, mm -hmm. and thinking about so oh, wonderful thanks and Fong how about for you where do you find that it fits in the course um, I think for most of uh, the ones, the times that I've used it, it's mainly been um, after. So it's really, um, they've received um, a lecture or some sort of didactic component uh, teaching. And then usually we have the H5P embedded afterwards as, as quiz questions or just, you know, just for checking to see if they understand the knowledge. So they're called knowledge checks. Um, the video that um, Irene had shown about that case, that was actually released after the lecture was given. Because I find that if the information is given beforehand, sometimes depending upon how much information is given, it could be just a bit of a information overload. And so it makes the students a bit stressed. So I find that after they've received the lecture and been taught the information, then we usually release. So that's where I usually see it being used. So we see a big spread, hey, right from the very beginning, right to the very end, that it that it has um, utility in all those different places, depending on our context. Simon, I see you have a question from the chat. Go ahead. Uh, yes, this is for Louisa. Uh, for the discussion questions, would these be answered in a Canvas discussion or ever in class? Are H5P activities ever done synchronously somehow? So the discussion, um, I'm using H5P in the discussions, um, as I said, just really as an excuse to uh, introduce a topic. So for, so for example, topic, the, um, the short animated movie that I use is about it's a fun movie from, from Pixar. I don't know if you know, it's called For the Birds. It's really quite a cute little movie. And it, 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 it shows how, um, how often, how it's often difficult for, for anyone to accept somebody who is very diverse, who's very different from us. So I have the questions and those are the questions that actually I don't check whether students, so that's, a, that's the one I'm not checking in that case, whether students are responding, it's just for them if they want. But I ask some questions um, that need to be discussed uh, in the discussion. So, so I talk about diversity, how, di how different are you? you know, can you describe yourself? Can you use some adjectives uh, to just describe yourself? And, and can you comment on the adjectives that are, the other students are using to describe themselves? And, and again, we're talking about Italian 101. This is, it was, I used that activity in week two of, uh, of so very limited. But in that case, it was just for me, I was using H5P as an excuse for introduce something that is important and serious, but in a fun way. And, and, and then get the student to, to talk um, about this topic. But again, it, it's a separate, it's used in a discussion. I'm not sure that I'm answering your question, Ayami. Let me know if not completely and uh, I'll find a better way to answer my question. Okay. <laughs> Louisa, when you've talked about, um, you talked about having students share a screenshot at the end, once they get their little summary of the questions they've answered, how do you functionally do that? How do you assign mark? Like, how do you go about assigning marks to that? Um, I think you said complete, incomplete, but what does that look like just, functionally for you? 
it's just completing complete. So I have 10 of those videos and each each video is 10 points mm -hmm. and, and it's completing complete. So I overall like, is it a canvas? Is it a canvas? Um, it, it is a canvas. So, so it is an assignment. Mm -hmm. So they had to submit the screenshot of the last the last uh, um, you know the last page of the video where they where they answer what let me show you again um uh, let me share again that um okay uh, where am i here okay so what they can you see this mm -hmm. so you see there are the five questions so this is a summary and i'm i'm simply asking them to take a screenshot and post that so I can see exactly, first of all, I can see if they answer correctly or not, or if there are some questions. Uh, they have multiple opportunities. They can go back. They can take this quiz multiple times, the, the, the questions multiple times, right? But if I see that is consistently, some of the students have not answered perfectly in, in one specific, I can go back in class. But it's uh, it's really quite simple for me. It's just complete and complete. And it takes me really very little time. And has anyone else on the panel, because because H5P doesn't have um, right now a lot of analytics that lets us track what a student has, which student has done what, is there anyone else on the panel that has used H5P and associated it with marks in your course? And if not, then how do you, is there any way that you do go about assessing whether students are finding these useful, whether they're using them? How do you assess once you put the H5P out into the void or on Canvas or wherever you embed it, whether it's useful um, and how they're doing with it? Uh, for me, it would be they would sometimes have a homework assignment. And then the homework assignment that they do on Canvas is based on um, on the H5P piece that they had to read or read and, and work through. Okay, so a follow-up assignment checking in. How about uh, Fong or Roger? Do you have anything in your courses where you're assessing how students are doing on those, or are they just um, living within within the online materials and um, they can choose to do it or not, and you're not tracking that? Yeah, the, the, for me, the latter. Although um, uh, Leah McFadden presented to the Faculty of Science in um, in December or early January. And she mentioned that in Canvas, there's an analytics um, data that's collected and you can download. I think it's 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 cached every two weeks. So you have to kind of download every two weeks, but it'll tell you where students are going and what they're doing. I haven't taken advantage of that, but that's one way to assess if those uh, activities are useful. But I always say, I'll get you on the test or I'll get you on the assignment. So if, mm -hmm. you know, if, if it's not effective and they can skip it, I'll, I'll get them on the assignment. So. So I think currently now um, <clears throat> what we've been able to do is because through the SAP, actually, we do have a survey that has been sent out asking students in terms of whether they've used um, the technology that we've provided with some of these course redesigns. Um, so H5P being a part of that. Uh, however, moving forward, I think when I spoke with my um, our team, because we do have an education technology team that works within our faculty, um, there is no specific analytics that they're aware of um, within H5P, but they were mentioning that if it's uploaded in a way uh, through Kaltura Media, they would be able to keep track of it in the future. So I think that I'm going to work with our team to sort of uh, use that tracking system to see, because right now we don't we we don't have any analytics except for the surveys that we have conducted to see if it has been useful. But I think moving forward, we're going to try to use something like that to sort of keep track to see how useful or whether students even log in to even look at it um, to see whether we should continue using it in the future. Thank you. In in an interest of time, I'm going to pause here and just see if anybody from um, that's joining us from the audience wants to ask any questions to our panelists. Or Simon, are there any questions in chat that? that uh, there's a, a bit of a discussion going on in chat about using yeah. things synchronously. Um, and I see some of our panelists have been really on the ball answering questions. So we're up to date with everything in the chat here. OK, wonderful. Well, feel free. If anyone does have a question, just raise your hand or keep asking in chat. Then maybe I'll ask, by a show of hands from our panelists, how many of you turn on the embed features that somebody else could take this stuff that you're creating and use it somewhere else? Use it. Okay, so 
String, why do you choose to put turn on the embed feature? I, I want everybody to see my work as much as as much as possible. And I'm yeah. I'm good if they take it and change it. It's yeah. under it's like under a CC license that lets them modify it for educational purposes. And Luisa, I saw an up down hand. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> well, because I'm not I'm not ready yet. Yeah. But uh, the intention is to make it as public as possible, as open as possible. The intention, yes, absolutely. Yeah. To be honest, I don't know, and I'll, I'll defer to Manuel on that. <laughs> <laughs> Manuel, where? Yeah, do you, mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, it's on canvas, so I think. Oh, so know, it's it's, it's not, hidden. It's it's hidden. Um, right. It's it's available. Um, if we were, let's say, to develop everything on WordPress, technically, and that's a conversation we could have with Roger. But uh, I would suspect we could have people embed if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. But Manuel, Canvas is not allowing, allowing anything like this. Manuel, while I have you here, I have a, que a question for you as well, which is for people who might be interested in um, having their content available and be able to share it so that others can access it and that their hard work can go further beyond their own courses. Is there anywhere right now that we could be sharing our work to where it would be discoverable potentially by other people or anywhere where we should be looking when looking for resources that we could be perhaps reusing or repurposing something that someone else has already made. That's more of a Will Engels question, I guess. Okay. Will, Will are you willing to jump in? Um, there's a couple of great resources. I'll just say right now that the H5P, the UBC H5P service doesn't have an easy way to share that. So um, you can embed in any public site. So we do have a WordPress service called uh, UBC Blogs that anybody can start. You can create your own H5P repository right there, put your elements right on a, a blog, um, embed to that. And that's a great way to do it. Um, there's other sort of um, OER repositories out there that may, may be more subject disciplinary. Um, I'm just going to show an example of one of my favorite places of finding ones. Um, if I can pull it up really quick, is the Pressbook directory. And if you're not, we've we've used the term Pressbook um, a couple of times, but if you're not super uh, famous with it or super familiar with it, it is a open textbook creator. Um, and within open textbooks, there's often H5P elements. Sorry, I'm just pulling up the site. Um, and I showed this slightly earlier, um, or this was showed slightly earlier, um, but they do have a open directory. So if you look at this, they have over 6,000 um, open textbooks within this. Um, one of my favorite things to do is you can go down and sort by H5P activity. So if I add, filter by H5 activity, so if I want just textbooks with at least one act, H5P activity, um, I can set that as a filter. Um, and for example, maybe I'm looking for French textbooks and it takes just a minute to pull it up. Um, but here I can see there's roughly uh, 263 books that have at least a French keyword um, with at least one H5P activity and some with, with very many. Um, there's, there's another great um, repository out there. I'm just going to quickly Google it while I'm up. Um, the eCampus um, Ontario repository as well. Um, and this is a great place also to look for, for resources that are available. Um, so you can go ahead and search um, by keywords or by, you can drill down by subject. Um, so if I look in literature and search, it'll filter by actual specific literature. Over here, I can see the license types. So those with a Creative Commons license are specifically great for reusing. Um, the U is just sort of unlisted. They don't have a they haven't designated a license, and then you can go ahead and click click on it. So here's just a module checklist um, that someone has created and shared, but I could go ahead and reuse it. And that, that's a really quick overview. Thank you so much for jumping in there, Will. Sorry for putting you on the spot no, there. Go no, ahead. No problem. Go ahead, Simon. I see that you have a question from chat. Uh, yes, I started using vector images from Adobe Stock by UBC's educational uh, license for language learning activities in H5P. And I'm super worried that the share tab, uh, any thoughts about copyright licensing issues if other people take those images from my H5P? I, th I think that um, would largely be um, contingent on the licensing of the pictures themselves. I like using, I, they don't use Victor images, but I like using Pix Pixabay 
which is a free image, um, which have very liberal licensing policies. And so I use the share tab on my own things and wherever possible, I like to use Pixabay uh, because that then um, uh, gives me a little bit of confidence. And then also uh, it, that they can be shared and not going to get into any trouble. Um, also, what I've started using is ChatGPT to create images as well. Um, I'm not. I'm sure you would be able to create some of them in a vector um, style, uh, but I'm not sure what the learning curve would be like for that. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll just throw in that Wikimedia Commons. You can find a lot of um, uh, good images there, CC licensed or or um, open or uh, royalty free, public domain. I mean. And then also I'd add in that if you're using H5P, whenever you put in an image, has a place where you can put in all the copyright information about that image. And so if it's something that you have the rights to use, you can be using it, I imagine, but then you can also copy over all that copyright information. So that anybody who is wanting to use it can see what the copyright is of each individual element that um, you have as part of your presentation if you've been keeping that information in as part of your content. Simon, do we have any more questions from chat? No, just says uh, public domain and CC image resources. Here's a list of OER sources by types, images, tab, or uh, for image, for the finding images, just so a couple of resources that are available. Okay, then I think perhaps we'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask one final question and um, Strang, I'm gonna put this one to you. I'm wondering, do you have any advice for someone who might be starting out with H5P, anything that you wish you knew when you were starting out um, with put, putting all your content onto H5P? I mean, as, as long as you have a clear idea that you want to create an interactive piece, I would say just go for it and experiment. And then maybe the first one won't be that good, but you know, you'll, you'll get the hang of it. It's, it's, it's once you just get in, just get in there and start playing around with it. And you, and even if you have very little technical background, you can get it going and make something cool. Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for the H5P conference and for the panelists for sharing all of this wonderful information, for sharing your projects that you put so much time into and for answering all our questions and helping inspire everyone. I'm going to pass over um, to Simon now. And that brings us to the end of our symposium. Um, thank you very much for attending. Uh, a couple of thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you very much again to our panelists. That was fascinating. I learned a lot. Um, and it's wonderful seeing um, sort of just the, the array of usage and sort of knowledge that's being built up around H5P. Um, I'd also like to say a thank you to our keynote speakers, Dr. Cynthia Brain and Sven Torre with for their um, fascinating insights on how to make effective videos in education and then what we can do with um, AI and H5P moving forward to um, maybe sort of decrease the learning curve or at least speed up the, the pace at which we can create um, interactivities for, for our students. Um, I'd also like to thank you for the educational and technology developers, Stephen Michaud and Richard Tape, who um, hosted a really fascinating lunchtime discussion yesterday for donating your time, your expertise, and then also your uh, what you've been doing behind the scenes to make the H5P um, hub here at OBC work as well as it's been working and the improvements that you're working on too. Um, and then a huge, huge, massive thank you to Will Engel, Rie Namba, Manuel Diaz, Bo Sun Kim, Lucas Wright, and John Cheng, as well as the OER Rapid Innovation Grant. Um, without any of you, this, this symposium would not be happening at all. Um, it's been a, a pleasure working with you over the past six months. Um, this is the second time we've run the symposium. And if anything, I am motivated to rock all of you in to do a third one next year. So thank you for your expertise, your patience, your guidance. It's been a real pleasure working with you. And that brings a close to the symposium. We are going to be having three more of those um, studio sessions that if you are inspired by today and you kind of need that impetus, as many of our panelists have said, you need something to hold you or to push you or you're not quite sure and you need to learn. We've got three studio sessions coming up over the, the next three weeks where you can come and speak to an HYP expert. Uh, to take the plunge into seeing how you can use H5P in your own class. So with that, thank you very much. And we hope to see you all uh, at the very latest next year at the next symposium, hopefully if we have one.
And I would just like to to quickly hop on and and thank uh, Kaylee and Simon quite a bit for not only uh, being part of the planning committee for this H5P symposium, but also for hosting a lot of the sessions and, and putting together um, their experiences and expertise um, and sharing that with everybody. So it's, it's always a pleasure to work with with you guys. And thank you so much for, for dedicating your time to this. It's our pleasure. Thank you very much, everyone.